Parandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakzur Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasate Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare We're reading chapter number uh, 61 Krishna's genealogy and we're hearing about Krishna's different family members, the different children from each of his wives. So it was described how Krishna's uh, Krishna had one son Prajumna oh, and, and no his grandson his grandson Aniruddha and he got married to uh, the, the the he got married to Ruk, Rukmi's uh, granddaughter Aniruddha married Rukmi's. And previously already Prajumna who was the father of Aniruddha, Prajumna had married Rukmavati, who was a daughter of Rukmi. Rukmavati was the daughter of Rukmi. And she got married to Prajumna. And then Prajumna's son, Aniruddha, he got married to the granddaughter. The granddaughter's name was Rochana. So when Suk when Maharaj Parikshit heard this, he was surprised and he asked Sugadeva Goswami to explain how they could get married like that because Rukmi was the enemy of Krishna. Yeah, Rukmi hated Krishna because they, they remember Krishna had when Krishna kidnapped Rukmini, who was the sister of Rukmi, Ruk, Rukmi was very angry. And at that time, there was a fight. Krishna had cut off the hair of Rukmi and disfigured him. He didn't kill him because he'd married Ru he's, he's, he's taking Rukmini for his wife. So he didn't kill her brother. 
แต่ไม่ได้ทําการสังหารไม่ได้ฆ่าไปแต่แค่เพราะว่ากําลังแต่งงานกับน้องสาวอยู่ก็เลยแบบไม่ไม่ได้ตั้งใจจะฆ่าพี่ชาย But he cut off his hair and he humiliated him. ก็คือมีการตัดผมแล้วก็ทําให้เขาเนี่ยเอ่ออับอาย So Rukmi was an enemy of Krishna. Rukmi เนี่ยเป็นศัตรูของ Krishna. But so when he when Maharaj Parikshit heard how the, the two the son and the grandson of Krishna got married to Rukmi's daughter and granddaughter, he was surprised. เพราะฉะนั้นเราทำให้ปริชิมาราเนี่ยรู้สึกแปลกใจตอนที่รู้ว่าหลานของเอ่อกิชานเนี่ยแต่งงานกับเอ่อลูกของรูปนี้เนี่ยได้ยังไง So Sukadeva Goswami is explaining how it happened that they got married like that. แต่ Sukadeva Goswami ก็จะอธิบายต่อว่าเกิดการแต่งงานแบบนั้นขึ้นได้ยังไง He said Prajumna was the eldest son of Krishna. บอกว่าพระดุมนาเนี่ยเป็นลูกชายคนโตของคริสนา And he was born from Rukmini. Rukmini was the first wife of Krishna. แล้วก็เกิดจากมารดาที่ชื่อว่ารุกมินีรุกมินีเป็นภรรยาเอกของคริสนา And Prajumna was actually Cupid. He was the god Cupid, the god of love, and so he was very handsome and very attractive. แต่พระดุมนาเนี่ยเป็นเทพเจ้าเป็นเหมือนกรรมเทพเพราะฉะนั้นมีความสง่างามมาก So it happened that Rukmi's daughter, Rukmi had a daughter named Rukmavati, and she was to pick her husband. She was, and all the kings came, and she was to pick out which man she wanted to marry. แต่ตอนนั้นเนี่ยก็มีลูกสาวที่ชื่อว่ารุกมาวัตีเนี่ยซึ่งเป็นลูกสาวของรุกมีเนี่ยเขาก็กำลังจะเข้าพิธีสมรสอยู่ก็กำลังดูอยู่ว่าจะสมรสกับใคร So when she saw Prajumna. Because he was Cupid, he was so good-looking, she could not resist him. She immediately chose him to be her husband. And she put her gar she put the garland around Prajumna, in the indication that he is now my husband. แล้วนางก็ให้พวงมาลัยกับกระดุมนางแล้วก็ตัดว่าตอนนี้เนี่ยเป็นสามีของนาง So when she did that, then all of the other kings got angry and there was a bit of a fight. แล้วหลังจากที่นางได้เลือกเช่นนั้นไปเนี่ยคนอื่นก็กษัตริย์องค์อื่นที่มาร่วมงานก็รู้สึกไม่พอใจแล้วก็เกิดการต่อสู้กัน But but Prajumna Prajumna came out. He won. He defeated everyone, and he took Rukmavati for his wife. And Rukmi, who was the father, he he agreed. I said, "Yeah, all right. Now, so my daughter will be your wife." ไม่ได้ติดอะไรบอกว่าโอเคงั้นตอนนี้เดี๋ยวลูกสาวของฉันก็จะเป็นภรรยาของเธอ But in Rukmi's heart there was always this hatred of Krishna that Krishna had insulted him because Krishna had kidnapped his sister Rukmini แต่ในใจของรุกมีเนี่ยก็ยังมีความแค้นอยู่ว่าที่กิชนาเนี่ยสุประมาทเขาแล้วก็รักฆ่าตัวน้องสาวไป And Ru but Rukmi, he loved his sister. He loved Rukmini very much. So when his daughter got married to Rukmini's son, he had to agree. But he had a lot of love for his sister. So when he got married to Rukmini, he had to agree. So in this way, Prajumna became the son-in-law of Rukmi. So Prajumna became he became the son-in-law of Rukmi, but he was also the the nephew of Rukmi. ในลักษณะนี้เนี่ยพระดุมนาก็เลยกลายเป็นลูกเขยของรุกมีแต่ว่าความจริงแล้วมีศักดิ์เป็นหลานด้วย Because he married the, he married Rukmi's daughter and he was also the son of Rukmini who was the sister of Rukmi ก็เป็นเพราะว่าเขาเนี่ยเป็นมีศักดิ์ก็คือ
แต่งงานกับลูกของอาน So Rukmini was married to Krishna, and they had ten sons, and they had one beautiful daughter. Rukmini เนี่ยแต่งงานกับ Krishna แล้วก็มีลูกชายสิบคนแล้วก็มีลูกสาวหนึ่งคน And the, the daughter had very big eyes, and she was, and she got married to k r i t a v a r m a s son, whose name was Bali. Krita Krita Varma. Krita Varma. Yeah. So although Rukmi Rukmi was an enemy of Krishna, he had a lot of love for his sister Rukmini. And he always wanted to please his sister in every way. So when Rukmini's grandson, Rukmini's grandson was Aniruddha. Aniruddha was the son of Prajumna. So when Aniruddha was to be married, at that time Rukmi offered his granddaughter. To Aniruddha. แล้วก็ตอนนั้นเนี่ยอานิรุดเนี่ยเป็นหลานของรุกมินีเนี่ยก็เอ่อก็เข้าก็จะสมรสแล้วก็รุกมินีเนี่ยก็จึงแบบว่าเสนอหลานสาวคนโตให้ So Ani, uh, uh, the daughter of Rukmi, the the granddaughter of Rukmi was named Rochana. แล้วก็หลานสาวของรูปมีเนี่ยชื่อว่าโรชนาโรชนาเยอะ so she was offered to Aniruddha แล้วเขาเนี่ยก็ได้แบบว่าถวายให้กับอนิรุดธ so actually in the very culture it's not proper for cousins to get married ตามหลักของประเวทแล้วเนี่ยมันไม่ค่อยสมควรที่พวกญาติญาติกันเนี่ยจะมาแบบแต่งงานกันญาติที่ใกล้ชิดกันขนาดนี้แต่งงานกัน But to please Rukmini, Rukmi offered his daughter. แต่ว่าเพื่อให้รุกมินีเนี่ยดีใจรุกมีก็เลยเสนอลูกสาวของตัวเองให้ He offered his daughter, and then he offered his granddaughter to the son and the grandson of Krishna. ให้ลูกสาวด้วยแล้วก็หลานสาวแด่ลูกชายและหลานชายของพระชนม So in this way, they arranged for the marriage of Aniruddha with Rochana. So when they arranged for the marriage, there was a it was a big marriage, and uh, a big party came all the way from Dwarka. They came all the way from Dwarka. They brought Aniruddha, and they all came from Dwarka. ก็มีการมาจากดวารกากันใหญ่เลยก็มีการมีขบวนสมรสเนี่ยที่ยิ่งใหญ่ก็มาจากดวารกากันจัดมา And they had they came all the way to the place called Bojakata. แล้วก็มาก็เดินทางกันมาถึงที่ที่เรียกว่าโบจาคาชา Rukmi had made a a town there. He come there after After Krishna kidnapped Rukmini, then Rukmi had come there and he lived there. So when the marriage party came. In charge, the head of the marriage party was Lord Krishna himself because he was the grandfather of the groom. The groom was Aniruddha. Lord Krishna is the grandfather, so he came with them all, and Lord Balaram also came. The k a b u n s o m r o d ในครั้งนี้เนี่ยก็นำโดยเสด็จปู่ Krishna ซึ่งถือว่าเป็นเสด็จปู่ของ Aniruddha และก็มีพระองค์เจ้าวลาราด้วย And they also came with Krishna's first wife, Rukmini. 
And Krishna's oldest son, Prajumna, also came. And Jambavati's son, Samba, he also came. And there were many other relatives and family members. So they all came to this town of Bojakata and then the marriage was performed very nicely, very peacefully. So Rukmi had also invited some of his friends and one of his friends was the king of Kalinga. So this king of Kalinga, he told Rukmi, he told him that he should try to play, he should challenge Balaram to a game of dice. He told him that this Balaram, he doesn't know how to play chess. You'll easily beat him. So he said, you can bet with him, you can gamble with him. And you can win, you can take all of his wealth. So it's common among Kshatriya kings that they like to gamble. Sometimes they'll gamble when they play chess, sometimes they gamble when they throw dice. So if somebody challenges a Kshatriya to a game, either of chess or the dice, then the, ch the Kshatriya cannot refuse the challenge. So this king of Kalinga, he knew that Lord Balaram was not very expert at playing chess. So the idea was that if Rukmi challenged them to a game of dice or chess, he could get revenge against the family of Krishna. Lord Balaram would rep represent the family of Lord Krishna. So Rukmi thought this is a good idea. He thought, yes, we should do this. I will get revenge on them. So Lord Balaram wasn't very good at playing these games. He wasn't very good at chess. But he was very enthusiastic and he always liked to play different sports. So when Balaram got challenged, he thought, yeah, very nice. So he accepted Rukmi's challenge and he sat down to play. So they began to bet. First of all, they began bet. They were betting with gold coins. And the first of all, first game they challenged. Balaram challenged one hundred gold coins. 
่และครั้งแรกก็ทาทายบารังก็ทาไปหนึ่งร้อยเหรียญทอง And then second time they challenged the, not one hundred but one thousand coins. And then the third time, ten thousand coins. So each time Balaram lost and Rukmi was the winner. แล้วก็รูปมีก็ชนะมาด้วยตลอด So every time when Lord Balaram lost the king of Kalinga was there and he would criticize Krishna and Balaram แล้วแต่ละครั้งที่บาลารามแพ้เนี่ยเอ่อก็จะเปิดโอกาสให้กษัตริย์คาลินนี้เนี่ยวิจารณ์กษัตริย์แล้วก็บาลาราม Yeah the king was always joking saying joking words about Krishna and Balaram And he would purposely show his teeth to Balaram. So Balaram was losing. He lost the first few games, so he wasn't very happy. Balaram, he was not very happy. ดีใจมากเพราะว่าเริ่มแพ้ไปแพ้ไปในเกมแรกแรก And so when they were when this king of Kalinga was speaking joking words about them and being nasty to them, then Balaram got a little angry. แล้วก็ตอนไอ้กษัตริย์กษัตริย์คาลคาลิงกาเนี่ยเริ่มพูดแบบไม่ดีใส่เขาเยอะเย้ยเนี่ยครั้งก็เริ่มรู้สึกหงุดหงิดและเริ่มรู้สึกไม่ดี So then Rukmi again challenged Lord Balaram. He said, "Let's have another game." He said, "This time the bet is a hundred thousand gold coins." But this time Lord Balaram won. But Rukmi was so cunning that he claimed. That Balaram was a loser, and that actually he had won. So this was actually a lie. Rukmi was lying. It wasn't true. Lord Balaram was a winner. So Balaram became very angry with Rukmi. I said, Lord Balaram was so angry that he appeared. He was like a, a tidal wave in the ocean on a full moon day. It's like a big wave, you know. So Lord Balaram's eyes are naturally red, but when he becomes angry, his eyes become more red. So this time he made a new bet. He said, "This time we bet a hundred million coins." เราบอกว่าครั้งนี้เนี่ยเราขอไอ้นี่อีกทีหนึ่งหนึ่งขอพันล้านอีกทีหนึ่งแต่ครั้งนี้ขอเป็นหนึ่งล้านเหรียญไอ้หนึ่งพันหนึ่งร้อยหนึ่งร้อยล้านเหรียญ Yes So then again Balaram was the winner But again, Rukmi claimed that he was the winner. And all the people who were around, who were watching, they were nearly all the friends of Rukmi. So Rukmi said to them all, "Am I not the winner? Isn't it true? I'm the winner." And they all wanted to support him. แล้วก็รูปมีก็เหมือนกับหาพวกแล้วบอกพวกพวกพวกว่าฉันไม่ชนะหรอเนี่ยฉันชนะชัดเลยฉันชนะเนี่ยแล้วทุกคนก็แบบว่าพูดตามว่าเออใช่เธอชนะ
And he asked especially his good friend, the king of Kalinga, who is the winner? And of course, the king of Kalinga said, yes, of course, you're the winner. So at that time, then there was a voice from the sky and it said to everyone, it said, it said to everyone, actually it said, Balaram is the actual winner of this game. And Rukmi is saying he's a winner, he's, it's not true, he's telling a lie, he was not the winner. winner. Balaram was the winner. But despite the voice from the sky, Rukmi was insisting that he said, No, I'm the winner. Balaram lost. So Rukmi was persistent. He was insisting he was a winner, so it actually it meant he was getting ready to die. <laughs> He's not going to live very long. He was he would he'd become very proud because of the bad advice, because of bad association, he'd become very proud. He didn't give much importance to the voice which spoke from the sky. So he began to criticize Balaram. And he said, Balaram, you two brothers, you're just cowherd boys. You don't know how to play chess. Mm. It's a, he said, you may be good in taking care of cows, but you cannot be, you're no good at playing chess. You don't know how to play chess. You don't know how to fire arrows on the battlefield. That's not for you. You're just cowherd boys. You don't know these things. That These things are for kings. <laughs> So, Ruk, Rukmi said to Krishna is, and Balaram, he said, these arts, these things like playing chess and throwing arrows, shooting arrows, these are no, only known by the prince, those people in the royal family, from the family of kings. So when Balaram heard this kind of talk, and he was not pleased. And he could hear the other princes, all the other princes who were there, they were all laughing at him. So Lord Balaram became angry, just like burning coals in a fire. So he immediately picked up his club and without talking anymore, he hit Rukmi on the head and killed him. So 
ค่ฟาดไปที่หัวของรูปมีทำให้รูปมีเสียชีวิตลงทันที So from from one blow รูปมี fell dead and he was gone finished with that one hit of the club แล้วแค่โดนคาทาไปแค่รอบเดียวตีหัวเนี่ยปรากฏรูปมีก็ตายสิ้นชีพไปเลยทีเดียว So Rukmi was killed by Balaram on the auspicious day of Aniruddha's marriage. Rukmi got on Sanghan by Balaram on the day of the wedding of the Aniruddha. So this is the kind of thing which happens in the Shatria families when you're in the families of these great kings. This is how they live. That they often fight with each other and kill one another. So the king of Kalinga was watching, and then he he became afraid because he thought the Balaram would kill him, so he tried to run away. But before he could escape, even a few steps, Balaram captured him. So the king had always been showing his teeth when he was laughing and criticizing Balaram. So Balaram broke all the king's teeth. Balaram just took his club and he smashed him and broke all of his teeth. Balaram got a cut up, fired by Prakopa Fun Hat and what more than five. And the other princes, the other people who were supporting Rukmi and the king of Kalinga. They also got captured by Balaram, and Balaram beat them with his club, and broke their legs, and broke their hands. So they didn't try to fight Balaram, and they just tried to run away from him. So during this fight between Balaram and Rukmi, Krishna didn't say a word. He didn't say anything. Krishna knew that if he if he took the side of Balaram, then Rukmini wouldn't be happy. Krishna saw what happened. And if Lord Krishna had said that the killing of Rukmi was not good, then Balaram would not be happy. So Lord Krishna decided best thing to do is not say anything; just keep quiet. Even though it's the death of his own brother-in-law, Rukmi, but he didn't say anything. He didn't want to do anything to disturb the nice relationship which he had. With Balarama and with Rukmi. So then, after this, then the bride, the bride that's uh, the granddaughter of Rukmi, her name was Rochana, and the bridegroom, that's Aniruddha, they were put on the chariot, and they were sent to Dwarka. Then, 
แล้วก็ให้ให้เดินทางไปก็มีทั้งเจ้าบ่าวเจ้าสาวก็มีรูจนาแล้วก็อันมีรูจ And they were they were accompanied by the bridegroom's party by Aniruddha's party, meaning Lord Krishna and Rukmini and Prajumna and Samba and all of these people. So they were always protected by Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is famous as a killer of the Madhu demon. พวกเขาก็ได้รับการคุ้มครองโดยคริสนาคริสนาผู้เป็นผู้เป็นผู้ที่มีชื่อว่าสังหารมารมาดู So they all left Bojavati Bojakata and they left to go back to Dwarka in a happy mood. แล้วทุกคนออกจากโบจาคาตาไปแล้วก็เดินทางกลับไปและมีความสุข So this is the end of the story about The family members of Lord Krishna. All right, we'll go on to chapter 62, which is entitled Usha and Aniruddha. Uh, Now we just heard how Aniruddha got married to Rochana, who was the granddaughter of Kamsa of uh, Rukmi. But here we're going to hear how Usha gets another wife. Uh, Aniruddha gets another wife. All right. So the meeting of Aniruddha and Usha caused a great fight between Lord Krishna and Lord Shiva. So it's a very interesting and mysterious pastime. And Maharaj Parikshit was eager to hear the whole story from Sukadeva Goswami. So Sukadeva tells Maharaj Parikshit, he said, "You must have heard the name of King Bali. He was a great devotee who gave away, who gave, who gave." Away in charity, all that he had. And he he gave away. The, he had a lot to give away. He he was the king of the world, and he gave away the whole world to Lord Vamanade. Lord Vamana is the incarnation of Vishnu. He's a dwarf Brahmana. So it was Lord Vamana Dev who came to beg the three steps of land from Bali Maharaj. And this way, he took away the whole world from Lord Bali Maharaj, and he gave it back to the demigods. So that King Bali. He had 100 sons, and the oldest of all of the sons was Bana Sura. So Bana Sura was born of Maharaj Bali, and he was a, and he was a great devotee of Lord Shiva. แล้วก็บานาสบานาสุราเนี่ย
กิดจากมหาราชบาลีเนี่ยผู้ที่เป็นพอเป็นสาวกผู้ยิ่งใหญ่ของพระศิวะ He always wanted to do service for Lord Shiva. So because Banasura was a, uh, because of his devotion to Lord Shiva, he got a big position in society, and he was honored in every way. แล้วก็เนื่องจากเขาเนี่ยมีการแบบอุทิศตนต่อพระศิวะเป็นอย่างมากเนี่ยเขาก็เลยได้รับการเชิดชูเนี่ยจากทุกด้าน And he was very intelligent and very generous, also. And he, all of his activities were very glorious. He never deviated from his promise and his word of honor. He was very truthful. And fixed in his vows. So he was a king. He was ruling from the city of Sonitapur. And by the grace of Lord Shiva, Banasura had one thousand arms. ด้วยพรของพระศิวะเนี่ยทำให้บานาสุระเนี่ยมีหนึ่งพันมือ And it was so powerful that even demigods like King Indra were serving him. แล้วก็เขาเนี่ยมีพลังมหาศาลจนแม้แต่เราเทวดาอย่างพระอินเนี่ยก็รับใช้เขาอยู่ And so long ago in the past, Lord Shiva had been dancing. And Lord Shiva dances. He does that special dance called Tandava Nritya. Uh, and because he does this dance, Lord Shiva has got the name Nataraj, the King of Dance. เป็นเพราะว่าท่านเนี่ยทำการเต้นในครั้งนี้เลยมีพระนามว่านัตราเออเป็นเทพแห่งการเต้นเลย So Banasura he helped Lord Shiva in his dancing. He helped him because he was playing the drum. Very he beat the drum with his thousand hands. แล้วก็บานาสุระเนี่ยเป็นผู้ช่วยพระศิวะในการเต้นรำในการเต้นรำนี้เนี่ยพระบาลสุระเขาจะตีเขาจะตีกองให้เป็นจังหวะเขาจะตีโดยการใช้พันมือของเขา So Lord Shiva is Asutosh he is very easily pleased and when the demon b a n a s u r a played the drum nicely Lord Shiva became very pleased พระสิวะเนี่ยมีพระนามว่า Asutosh นั่นก็แปลว่าท่านเนี่ยโปรดปรานเนี่ยง่ายทําให้ท่านพึงพอใจได้ง่ายเพราะฉะนั้นหลังจากที่มารท่านนี้เนี่ยตีกอให้พระศิวะแบบนี้พระศิวะก็โปรดปรานเขา So Lord Lord Shiva always likes to protect people who take shelter of him พระศิวะทรงเป็นผู้ที่ชอบปกป้องสําหรับบุคคลที่เอาพระองค์เอาท่านเนี่ยเป็นที่พึง And Lord Shiva is a master Of all living entities in the material world. So Lord Shiva told Bana, he said, "I'm very pleased with you." He said, "Whatever you want, you can ask from me, and I will give it to you." เธอปรารถนาสิ่งใดเนี่ยเธอขอฉันได้เลยเดี๋ยวฉันจะให้ So then b a n a s u r a said to Lord Shiva he said All right if if you want to please me you please stay in my city just you stay here just to protect me and if any of my enemies come and attack me you can help me and defend me แล้วก็ปาสุระจะบอกว่าโอเคพอของปาคือข้าเนี่ยอยากจะให้เจ้าเนี่ยอยู่ที่นี่ 
แล้วใครแล้วก็ดูแลคุ้มครองที่นี่ถ้าเกิดว่าใครมาเนี่ยศัตรูที่ไหนมาเนี่ยเธอก็ช่วยข้าในการต่อสู้กับศัตรู So one time Banasura came to offer his respects to Lord Shiva, and he touched the lotus feet of Lord Shiva. He touched the feet of Shiva with his helmet, and the helmet was shining like the sun glow. And he offered his obeisances unto Lord Shiva. So when he was offering his obeisances to Lord Shiva. At that time, Banasura spoke to Lord Shiva, and he said to Lord Shiva, "He said, anybody who has not fulfilled, who hasn't satisfied his ambition, will be able to do so by taking shelter of your lotus feet." <laughs> ผู้ใดที่ยังไม่ได้ตอบสนองความไฟฟันของตนเนี่ยจะสามารถทำได้ด้วยการมาพึ่งพระบาทรูปดอกบัวของพระองค์ Lord Shiva uh, Banasura said uh, your lotus feet are just like a desire tree from which we can get anything we want นาสุระเนี่ยก็บอกพระสิวะว่าพระบาทของพระองค์เนี่ยก็เหมือนเปรียบเสมือนกับต้นต้นไม้สมใจนึกที่เราเนี่ยขออะไรก็ได้ตามที่ใจเราปรารถนา So b a n a s u r a said to Lord Shiva, he said, "You have given me one thousand arms, but I don't know what to do with them." แล้วก็เขาก็จะบอกว่าพระองค์เนี่ยทรงประทานพรให้มือหนึ่งพันมือกับข้าแต่ข้าไม่รู้จะทำอะไรกับมันดี He said I cannot He said they they just they're just a burden for me because I cannot use them properly in fighting แล้วก็บอกว่าพอข้าแบบไม่ได้ใช้งานกับมันเลยมันก็เหมือนกับเป็นภาระให้ข้าไปเฉย I can't find anyone good enough to fight with me The only person who could possibly fight with me is you, Lord Shiva. You are the original father of the material worlds. So sometimes I feel that I feel like I want to fight with my arms, and I go out to find a person to fight me. But whenever I go out to find somebody to fight, everybody runs away. Because they know how powerful I am. But every time that I go out to find someone to fight with, I find that there is no one who is strong enough to fight with me. Because I think that I am very strong and I'm scared of being attacked by someone else. So I'm not able to find anybody who can give me a good fight. Because I'm not able to find anybody who can give me a good fight. So just to satisfy my hands, my arms, because they want to fight. So he said, "I go and beat the mountain. I beat my hands against the mountains, and in this way, I tear many great mountains to pieces." ภูเขาดีๆก็ถูกข้าทำลายหมดเพื่อให้
So Lord Shiva understood that the benediction which he'd given Banasura had become a problem for him. So Lord Shiva told Banasura, he said, you're a rascal. You are very eager to fight. But since you have no one to fight with you, you are distressed. You may think that there is no one in the world to, met, to oppose you except me. But Lord Shiva said, I say that you will eventually find such a person who can defeat you. So at that time, your, your life will come to an end and your flag will no longer fly. And the false pride which you have will be smashed to pieces. So after hearing Lord Shiva's statement, Banasura was Banasura uh, he was actually pleased. So Banasura was very, he was very puffed up because of his power, because of his strength, because of the blessings given to him by Lord Shiva. He had become very proud. But when he heard Lord Shiva tell him that there's somebody going to come who's more powerful than him and who would defeat him, then he was very happy. So Banasura went home with great pleasure and he always waited for the day when the person would come who would give him a good fight. And they would take away all his strength. So but Banasura was such a foolish, he, he was such a, he was such a foolish person. Uh, Demons are usually stupid, they're, they're foolish people. And often they have too much strength or too much opulence and they want to they want to show off their power. And they want to feel satisfaction when when they when they show their power to others. 
เราก็จะมีความพึงพอใจเวลาเขาได้แสดงแสดงไอ้ความไปเป็นในนี้ของเขาพลังของเขาสุดท้ายพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพวกพ They have power, but they don't know how to use it for the right purpose. They have power, but they don't know how to use it for the right purpose. They have power, but they don't know how to use it for the right purpose. They have power, but they don't know how to use it for the right purpose. They have power, but they don't know how to use it for the right purpose. They have power, but they don't know how to use it for the right purpose. They have power, but they don't know how to use it for the right purpose. They have power, but they don't know how to use it for the right purpose. They have power, but they don't มันมีบุคคลอยู่สองประเภทคือบุคคลประเภทที่เป็นสาวกกับบุคคลประเภทที่เป็นมาร So those people who are not devotees who are not Krishna conscious are generally referred to as the generally they generally they are devotees of the demigods แต่ก็ประเภทที่เป็นสาวกเนี่ยก็คือประเภทแบบว่าเป็นแบบเราเทวดา But the devotees, those who are devotees, they're devoted, they worship the supreme personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, or Lord Vishnu. แต่บุคคลที่เป็นสาวกเนี่ยส่วนใหญ่เขาจะบูชาพระกิสนาหรือพระวิษณุ And they will use everything for the service of the supreme Lord Krishna. เขาจะใช้ทุกอย่างไปในการรับใช้ But those people who are not Krishna conscious, they utilize everything for sense gratification. So Banasura is that kind of person. He's a perfect example of the person who does everything for sense gratification. So for his own satisfaction, uh, for his own, for his own satisfaction, he wants to use his power. Fight. But he couldn't find anybody to give him a good battle. Okay, so. We will find out what happens next week when we read more. Okay. So it's a long story. We'll hear about Aniruddha getting another wife. <laughs> And how Banasura becomes his father-in-law. All right. Are there any questions? Me, come t o w me, ha. Yes, from uh, Vishnu Priyamadhi. 
Her question is in the four regulative principle, the gambling is also there that we one should not do it. But uh, in the story of Kshetriya, we can see that often they are being they've been doing this gambling thing. So it's not against the Vedic uh, literature or Vedic law. But if you're a Kshetriya, then it's allowed. But there are no Kshetriyas in the Kali Yuga. Actually, Lord Shiva is not different from, from Sankarshan. At the same time, Lord oh. Shiva is a devotee of Sankarshan. It's hard to understand. It's like one and different. But they said the snakes on the body of Lord Shiva represent Lord Sankarshan. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, thank you, Guru Maharaj. อืมแต่ที่ก็ถามเรื่องภาษีวาก็ขอมูลที่ใส่บนคอภาษีวาบอกภาษีวาบูชาสังฆชาญหรือเปล่าเนี่ยท่านก็บอกว่าใช่แต
Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances. All glory to Sina Prabhupada. Guru Maharaj, I have a question that I've been having for a long time. I hope I can ask it today. How come for generations and generations of people of Hindu origin, how come they do not know this concept of a Supreme Lord? Like myself, you know, being a of Hindu origin. Only when I come to Krishna consciousness, then I know that there is something to be a concept of a Supreme Lord and then there are administrative demigods. But how come religions like Islam and Christianity, they have uh, some conception of a, of a god uh, and then they don't have uh, they, 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 so many other, other gods except for the Greeks like that or the Romans. Why is it that it has been hidden from Hindus all this while? Only if they become a uh, Vaishnava, then they know there is a Supreme Lord and then the rest are all uh, administrative demigods. Why is it like that, Guru Maharaj? Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Well, there's different understandings about creation. You know, in, in Christianity, they say God created the world in seven days. We're not told very much about how he did it. And generally, Christianity, they think life is only on this one planet. You see, they don't have knowledge about life on other planets. So they have a very limited understanding about the nature of life and about the creation of God. They think God only created life on this one planet and the other planets, there's no life there. Although there's a lot of evidence about unidentified flying objects, so many different times the different things appear in the sky, they cannot explain them. And so there, there's many reasons, it's a, big, it's a big subject matter, but if you look at Christianity, you know, it's a, Lord Jesus said, there's so much more I can tell you, but you're not ready to receive it. Because Lord Jesus was preaching in a desert to country people who were not very cultured or civilized. And even what, for what he did teach, they crucified him. The people where Lord Jesus was preaching, he was in a desert country, you know, and the people were quite barbaric. And so he had to preach according to what they could understand. That's the point. What can people understand? The teacher knows how much to present according to the understanding of the students. So people who are not so much developed, they cannot understand very much, so you keep it very simple for them. Okay. You see, just like Buddhist people, they don't believe in God. That, you know, they're atheistic, they can't, they don't believe in God, they simply believe, but they believe in Buddha, they have faith in the Buddha, you know, they have faith in the Buddha person, you know, they don't have faith in God, they don't believe in the divine energy or anything, but they just follow the Buddha, so they have faith in him, so follow him, and you know, that was as far as they could go, they're not, you know, they're atheistic people, they're not very well educated. So Lord Buddha came to cheat the atheists and he taught them, just follow me. So they followed him and then because they followed Lord Buddha, so they got some good result. Mm -hmm. อันนี้เนี่ยก็ได้บอกไว้ในตาลศาสนาที่ต่างกันออกไปอย่างศาสนาคิดเนี่ยจะบอกว่าพระเจ้าใช้เวลาสร้างโลกมานี้สิบวัน
understanding the realm of demigods, we see even in the Hindu culture, a lot of people, they think ultimately it's all one. And they think the demigods, these are just, this is just imagery, it's not real. They're just, they're just forms to meditate on and ultimately there's only the oneness and, or the nothingness. Oneness or nothingness, this is their understanding of the Absolute. Mm -hmm. And so different people have different understandings of what is God or who is God. You try to get them to understand something more is a difficult job. You know, to bring people up from materialism, to bring them up to understand first of all that there is God and God is a person. It's a long way up. It's a big way. It's a long way to go. Of course, we do see in the Vedic culture there's a hierarchy, there's a spiritual hierarchy. There are demigods and ultimately there's one supreme god. So that's stated in the Vedas. So people have, you know, have to be more educated gradually, you can understand. If you can bring people, first of all, to the Vedas, then from the Vedas, then you can bring them to understand the higher aspect of the Vedas, that there's a supreme god. In the Vedas it mentions about demigods and worship of demigods to fulfill our needs in material life. And so it's good for materialistic people, you know, demigod worship, it's helpful, people satisfy their desires. And then gradually they'll start to think about getting something which is eternal, instead of just something which is temporary, they'll want to know what do I have to do, because these demigods are giving only material things. So how do I get something which is eternal? So then... So then they can hear about the one Supreme Lord. Mm. So that, that it's a big, you know, it's a change in their thinking to bring them up from demigod worship, to bring them up to understand there's a Supreme Lord over everyone. Yes, Guru Maharaj. In, my, in the reading book, my reading scriptures through Bhagavad Gita, uh, uh, one girl brought her sister in and then after that, uh, at first one girl was very uh, enthusiastic about uh, the Bhagavad Gita reading. But as soon as uh, in chapter 2, early part of chapter 2 mentions of Lord Krishna being the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then uh, she wrote to me saying her sister is very upset by those statements and is persuading her to leave the group. Then I tried explaining to her, you know, and tell her, you know, just, just bear, bear with, it, with me some more. When we go on to read other chapters, things will become clearer to you. Uh, now we are just in chapter 2, then when we go on, you will understand more. So if your sister wants to leave, let her leave. Then she said, I need to show loyalty to my sister. So we are offended because uh, for us, uh, Lord Shiva is the Supreme Personality. Uh, we cannot uh, uh, tolerate to see uh, Lord Krishna mention the Supreme Personality here, so we are both leaving, we told like that. So I said, okay, up to you, uh, you leave, but you're welcome to come back again next time. I just told her like that. Mm -hmm. So the two sisters left. So like that, Guru Maharaj, but what Guru Maharaj meant, uh, explained just now is useful for my preaching because I can tell them about the um, gradual elevation from material to spiritual, the, the temporary material things that demigod give, which I can emphasize about that. Well, they were devotees to Shiva, was it? They are not devotees, Guru Maharaj, they are outsiders, non-devotees. Why, why did, but devotee, why devotee did they... Devotee of Lord Shiva, yeah, maybe some ardent followers of Lord Shiva, maybe followers like that. Lord Shiva, yeah. Why were they offended by the personality of Godhead? Because they want, they, they, in their mind, it's Lord Shiva is the supreme. Oh, Lord Shiva is... Oh, yeah, 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 Lord Shiva is supreme in the material world. 
yeah, I tried telling her, but then she wanted to show allegiance to her sister. No. So actually, actually, I was a bit uncomfortable because I don't know the sister. I know this person, but I don't know the sister. So I was a bit, uh, I had some trepidation about, you know, letting the sister come into the group. Because sometimes they come misunderstand and then uh, they are not patient to wait through, to mm. wait and, you know, let, let the Bhagavad Gita unfold, you know, as it unfolds and becomes more revelation. Yeah. But very strong views, some of them. But I've got a good group, you know, there are about 10 of them. Okay. About seven or seven, about seven or eight will come uh, every week. Sometimes uh, less people a particular week, but oh. then they are quite keen and they do come. They are quite, quite what, is, what are you reading now? Bhagavad Gita? Or? I'm reading Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, Bhagavad Gita Guru Maharaj. 2.47 now. Okay. Chapter 2, verse 47. We have reached up to there. But now a bit slow going because the purports are rather long. So we have a discussion after the after the reading. And then I am slowly introducing them to pronouns. And then uh, we, do, we also sing the Maha Mantra, get them to take turns to to do the call and response, Maha Mantra, teaching them uh, 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 some, some easy tunes, and then like that, Guru Maharaj, and introducing them to Srila Prabhupada's uh, daily purports. Uh, every day there is a, in the calendar, Prabhupada calendar, there is a purport there. Mm, so introducing good. them to those purports, yeah, I put a flower at the calendar, I take a photo, and then I send it to the group. Uh, I, I really, uh, I mean, I will really pray and I'm, I'll be very uh, happy and honoured and uh, very fortunate if one day Guru Maharaj can come into the group. It's at 10, it's a bit late, 9.45pm Malaysian time on Thursday. I will send the link to Guru Maharaj when, when Guru Maharaj is free can come. Okay, I'll see. Ah, uh, yeah, that will be very thrilling and uh, very interesting. The others are quite nice actually, they're very innocent people and they just want to... Uh, to know more. One has asked me for beads. I've posted beads to her beads and chanting bag and a picture of uh, Radha Madhava, which I laminated. I've got some gifts to give people. So I gave her a laminated picture of Radha Madhava from Mayapur. Oh, good. And then given her, yeah, I've got, a, I've got a lot of gifts I keep and then if people want, I give them gifts like this. So I gave her a chanting bag as a gift. The beads, I told her, are you purchased the beads? I told her because it's good for you to contribute to our temple as well like that Guru Maharaj. Okay. Thank you so much Guru Maharaj for uh, introducing me, seeing me to this service. It's I mean, it's really very uh, happy with the service and I also have my Ramayana reading group. There's only three of us reading Ramayana now. And uh, I, I and also another thing is that like Guru Maharaj mentioned, go to the house. So there's a lady near my house who I always give prasadam to. So I'm planning to go on Tuesdays at around between five to six to read Bhagavad Gita with her. Uh, taking Guru Maharaj's uh, advice to, to even reach out to people who don't have Zoom and things like that, you know, sit and read with her. She's very receptive to reading Bhagavad Gita. So I thought of going to the house and read with her like that slowly. She's 75 years old, Guru Maharaj. Oh, okay, very nice. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj, for your mercy, love and kindness. Uh, <laughs> I'm eternally uh, indebted to Guru Maharaj. <laughs> No. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sri Devi. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Okay, Archana, thank you very much. Archana? Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Okay, thank you and thank all the devotees. Okay, Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. Thank you, Guru Maharaj.